You ready? Okay, class, welcome back to Nuclear Security. Uh, this is Michael Nacht. I'm going to be giving the uh, lecture the first half of the session, both today and Wednesday. And Professor Van Bibber will handle the second part of each lecture today and Wednesday. And I'm going to talk today about some of the uh, individuals who were cited in the Wizards of Armageddon and then some of the core ideas that develop into nuclear strategy, which is still with us to this day. Uh, one quick uh, correction again from my last lecture, I received notice from a colleague at Livermore that I mentioned Tuxedo Park I described it correctly, but I mentioned that it was near Poughkeepsie and he corrected me. It's not on the east side of the Hudson River. It's on the west side uh, on Orange County uh, near Rockland County uh, on the west side of, uh, of the Hudson. So I stand corrected. Okay. Uh, shall we begin, Mansuk? Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Next slide. Oh, so uh, there were, even though the US uh, moved aggressively to develop and deploy a nuclear arsenal, simultaneously there were efforts made, some efforts made at disarmament and then separately at arms control. Disarmament is to literally get rid of weapons, make them inoperative. And that a report had been written in the government, the Atchison Lilienthal report in 1946. And it led to the Baruch plan. Baruch was a well-known financier, Wall Street financier who was uh, friendly with the Truman administration. And the Baruch plan was formally presented by Bernard Baruch to the United Nations calling for the uh, end of sovereign control of nuclear weapons and that they would all be under international control. This is at a time when only the United States had the weapons, 1947. However, uh, the Soviet Union felt that since the Americans had already developed the weapons, they would still have the knowledge of it. And uh, this would put the Soviets at a disadvantage. So they vetoed the Baruch plan in the Security Council of the United Nations. So this is the first failed effort at nuclear disarmament in the nuclear age. There were some uh, successful measures, most important of which was the Antarctic Treaty which banned nuclear weapon deployments in Antarctica. Uh, that was done in the late 50s. But more significantly was a very important meeting that was held in Cambridge, Mass. On trying to understand the meaning of arms control. Which led in 1960, which led to the uh, publication of an important book strategy and arms control It's a short book still worth reading to this day by Tom Schelling, who of course is the uh, author of uh, Arms and Influence and the Strategy of Conflict and won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2005. And at that time, a young analyst named Mort Halpern, and they wrote a book, Strategy and Arms Control, in which they uh, brought forth the first articulated definition of arms control, which was in contrast to disarmament, which is to get rid of the weapons, Arms control is much more broadly conceived as any measure that reduces the likelihood of war, the damage should war occur, or budgetary support for the preparation of war is arms control. And this is important because it was later read by uh, McNamara, who became Secretary of Defense under Kennedy, and who used it to further the arms control agenda to some degree in the Kennedy and Johnson years. The uh, most significant arms control measures 
uh, related to testing and the nuclear test ban treaty, I'm sorry, the, 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 the limited test ban treaty, the LTBT was signed initially by the Soviet Union, the United States and the United Kingdom in 1963. And this limited nuclear testing to only underground testing. All other testing, testing above ground, testing on the sea, under the sea, in the air and in space was prohibited. Uh, Kennedy was keen on this because he was very concerned that the Cuban Missile Crisis could have gotten out of control and brought on nuclear war and he wanted to do something about limiting the arsenals. Of course, 1963 was the year the treaty was completed, but it was also the year that Kennedy was assassinated. So he didn't have a chance to further uh, the arms control agenda. On the testing front, just to follow along that sequence for a minute, it was followed uh, 11 years later by the Threshold Test Ban Treaty. This was 1974 when Ford was present, having just replaced Nixon, who had resigned. And the Threshold Test Ban Treaty limited the yield of weapons tested underground to 150 kilotons. And, uh, oh, I should add that one reason that they were able to get the underground test limits of the threat of the limited test ban approved was that uh, Kennedy was concerned whether the Joint Chiefs would actually support the ratification of that treaty in Senate ratification. And the military agreed to do it because they became convinced that we could still advance the modernization of our weapons just with underground testing. So now this was not, this was not just the military saying, well, let's give up on nuclear weapons, let's be peaceful. No, it was, we could have this political achievement of having a limited test ban, but still modernize the weapons with underground testing. So 74 was the threshold test ban that was under Ford and then in 1996, under Clinton, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was signed by the United States. It was signed, but it was never ratified. I was leaving government at the time in 1998, and uh, Clinton appointed then Senator Biden, Joe Biden, now the president, uh, to orchestrate the ratification of the Senate for the comprehensive test ban, but it failed terribly. You know, you need two thirds vote of president and sitting members of the Senate. So if there are hundred sitting members, that would be 67 senators would have to vote to approve the ratification. And the actual vote was, uh, I think actually in a minority, there weren't even 50 senators who voted for ratification largely because there were a large number of senators, particularly Republicans, but also some Democrats, who were concerned that the Soviets could conduct very low yield tests, which would be in violation of a comprehensive test ban that would never be uh, identified, never, never be uh, discerned by the United States. So they didn't wanna give the Soviets that uh, loophole. So again, that's LTBT, TTBT and CTBT are the three acronyms for the three test uh, moratoriums. The first and the second were ratified and implemented. The third has been signed by most countries, but never ratified by the United States. The United States is not a member of the comprehensive test ban. I should say later on, years later, I was in the Obama administration and we took a hard look at again, the desire for comprehensive test ban since obviously President Obama was very supportive of it. And Obama became convinced that there was no way there'd be enough Senate support to ratify the treaty. So it was never ratified. Also another item uh, on the arms control agenda was the outer space treaty, which uh, prohibited nuclear weapon deployment in outer space. That was done in 1967. So there were efforts at uh, arms control and disarm, but it's a spotty record uh, at best. 
Continue. Now then we got into more significant arms control in the 70s. Nixon was president. And by the way, there's one uh, sort of interesting uh, political issue here. The Republicans generally are not supportive of arms control unless there's a Republican president. They're opposed to arms control when there's a Democratic president. The Democrats tend to be supportive of arms control, whoever is president. In 1972, the SALT one, in, SALT one Treaty was signed, an interim offensive agreement and the ABM Treaty. Now the background to this, I don't remember if I mentioned this before, but in 1967, when Johnson was still president and McNamara was Secretary of Defense, the US wanted to get on board a treaty that would limit missile defenses. This was based on the view that missile defenses in the nuclear age were destabilizing, meaning missile defense deployments would, would increase the possibility that one side would use nuclear weapons to strike first, thinking that the defenses of the other side would intercept the retaliatory uh, reaction of the first side. And uh, Kosygin, who was the Soviet uh, representative at the Glassboro summit in 1967, was very skeptical of this. And McNamara gave a two hour lecture on the destabilizing effects of missile defenses. And uh, later sent Kosygin a bunch of books to read about missile defense. Anyway, to make a long story slightly longer, uh, in 1969, the SALT I uh, negotiations began. They were actually started, they were starting in 1968 when Johnson was still president. But in the fall of 68, the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia because of a uh, regime that entered power under Dubček that was anti-Soviet and uh, Johnson was not uh, confident that he could have a negotiation with the Soviets while the Soviets had just invaded Czechoslovakia. So SALT I was delayed. It started in 69 under Nixon and Kissinger. And after three years of negotiations, it led to the interim offensive agreement, which was a limit for five years on offensive deployments. And more importantly, the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which limited defenses to just two sites on each side. Uh, this is, of course, a bilateral treaty, US-Soviet Treaty. The British and others were not involved. Bilateral Treaty, US-Soviet Treaty. Uh, the two sites were the national capital, Moscow and Washington, and one missile site 1,500 kilometers from the national capital. This was called SALT I, and it was a landmark a treaty. It was during this time that Kissinger observed in some ways that arms control is not about arms control. What he meant by that was, this is not just literally about the limitation of weapons, but it's a change of the whole political relationship between the US and the Soviet Union, which, he, which Kissinger hoped would open up economic ties between the two countries. Remember, the Soviets were completely isolated from the West on economic intercourse at this time. Uh, and he thought that if they opened up economic ties, this would ultimately lead to political mellowing of the Cold War. Any questions about this so far? OK. Um. Uh, what what's the reason behind only the two defense locations? Why is two the uh, the magic number? If you they want. wanted to have, uh, you know, I think McMahon would have been willing to go for uh, originally and even Kissinger possibly for no uh, missile defenses, but the Soviets wanted some, at least for symbolic reasons, and at least to protect Moscow. So it was you know negotiation is a swapping of uh, different. 
objectives and you have to compromise to get a deal. Okay. Uh, Professor, on that topic then, why do they always want to fight to remove our missile defenses if they wanted it to begin with? I'm sorry, what, why did... Why do, why do the Russians want to limit our missile defenses if they voted to have it to begin with? I mean, they, had, they were the first to deploy missile defenses, but they became convinced, perhaps, that the McNamara argument was correct and also remember the ABM treaty was linked to the interim offensive agreement. So it began to put a cap on the offensive weapons, which the Soviets thought also was in their interests, especially because they're very fearful that US technological strength and economic strength could ultimately outrace, outrace the Soviets. So. Uh, and they had some interest in mellowing relationships too with the United States, which became the policy of, de of detente, D-E-T-E-N-T-E, -E -E, French word, under, uh, under Kissinger. Um, there is a, there's not. Yes. Uh, there's a question. Anthony, go ahead. Um, yes. Hi, Professor. Uh, just a quick question. For these like armed treaties, the uh, all the, the weapons that uh, the, either the ballistic or the uh, the other missiles are uh, are land based and sea based. Are we considering like the uh, the air based one also including that section? Yes. Yes. Interim offensive agreement included all legs of the triad. So basically, there's no way that you can transfer, like, for example, transfer the missile to bomb to actually uh, kind of uh, pull this agreement. And there were limits on each of the elements. Uh, so no, I mean, you couldn't fool around a lot with transferring weapons from one leg of the triad to the other. Thank you so much. Yeah. Of course, uh, Ford lost the 76 election to Carter. Carter came in, he was supportive of arms control. And in 1979, the next round of arms control produced SOL II. Um, and that treaty was signed in the spring of 1979 with Carter and uh, Leonid Brezhnev, who had replaced Khrushchev. However, in December of 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, misspelled there, by the way, I see. Uh, and once the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, Carter felt there was no possible way uh, to reach ratification in the Senate on SOL II. So SOL II was an arms control treaty that was signed but never ratified. Um, and this was lead, would have led to further cuts in offensive weapons. The, the, the ABM treaty, by the way, was a, of indefinite duration. And it lasted until George W. Bush in 2002. I'll get to that uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, in 1987 was completed what is considered to be the landmark arms control treaty of the Cold War which was the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Remember the SOL treaties had to do with strategic weapons, weapons that could fly intercontinental ranges from the US to the Soviet Union, from the Soviet Union to the United States. But there were intermediate nuclear forces based in Europe. And the Russians also, Soviets also had them on the Sino-Soviet border. And in 1987, in a major uh, agreement, Reagan, who was then president, and Gorbachev, who was the Soviet head of state, reached the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was to eliminate all of them. This was an extraordinary achievement at the time. It's considered the landmark uh, treaty of the Reagan era. And this lasted until uh, just a few years ago, when uh, even under Trump, who was very supportive of Putin, uh, the US uh, accused the Russians of violating the INF Treaty, which has been uh, 
verified by the intelligence community in public uh, accounts. And uh, the US withdrew from the INF Treaty and so have the Russians. This was done now under the Trump administration. So you have the, the 1972 SALT Treaty, the interim agreement lasted only for five years, so that doesn't exist anymore. The ABM Treaty existed in perpetuity, but uh, was withdrawn by George W. Bush in 2002. The 79 SALT II Treaty never was ratified. The INF Treaty was ratified, but then uh, the US withdrew in the Trump administration. And that leaves a couple of others. In 1991, after George H.W. Bush replaced Reagan, he was able to complete the first START treaty, START one. SALT was strategic arms limitation talks, started strategic arms reduction talks. This was to actually lower the numbers. That was completed in 1991. And then a second treaty by George H.W. Bush in 1993 further reduced the offensive arms of deployed strategic weapons. And that's where things stood until the Obama years. This is when I had an opportunity to serve in the Defense Department. And Obama uh, was able to complete with uh, Medvedev. Medvedev, for a short period under Obama, uh, was the new Russian president. There was a time when Putin couldn't run again, um, although Putin still controlled policy. And Obama and Medvedev reached the New START Treaty. This is a New START Treaty, which was to replace START 1, START 2, and limit the number of deployed strategic nuclear weapons to 1,550 with 800 delivery vehicles on each side. That was a new START treaty. It was signed in 2009 and it entered into force. No, it, it was signed in 2010 and entered into force in 2011, February, 2011 for 10 years. Well, 10 years after 2011 is right now, February, 2021. And uh, just since Biden has come into office, he had a phone conversation with uh, Putin. This followed up earlier discussions between Putin and Trump about extension of New START. There is a uh, clause in New START that calls for a five-year extension of New START if both sides agree. And just last week, uh, the U.S. and Russia agree to the five-year extension. So the five-year extension of New START takes us, uh, if it stays in effect, until February, February 5th, 2026. So that is the key strategic arms agreement that still is in effect today the New START Treaty extended to 2026. All the others have disappeared. Okay. Now here are some more details about the, the treaties. Uh, the interim agreement, we can go over some of this more quickly because they're not in, in uh, they're not actively uh, in agreement anymore. They saw one agreement that had Nixon and Brezhnev signing the treaty in May 72 in Moscow it was a five year agreement to freeze of ICBMs. And Soviets had a slight numerical advantage in SLB in ICBMs that that point number two was greatly debated by in the Senate. Senator Jackson, a Washington state later a presidential candidate was deeply opposed to having given the Soviets this edge of 1,600 to 1,000 in ICBMs and said that all future agreements had to have numerical equality. And on the SLBM front, the US had 700 SLBM launchers on 44 subs 
the Soviets had 950 launchers. Okay, that's that one. Move along. The ABM treaty, each party limited to two ABM sites with 100 ABM interceptors each, one for the national capital, one for an ICBM field. It was in permanent duration until the US exercised its right to withdraw in June 2002 to deploy ABM systems that would defend targets against North Korea and Iranian offensive systems. And this allowed the US to deploy limited ABM systems in Alaska and California to defend US targets from limited Russian missile attack and also uh, to deploy uh, missile defenses in, uh, in Europe to defend against Iranian missiles because the Iranians were targeting NATO targets in Europe and uh, to deploy in uh, South Korea and or Japan to defend against North Korean missiles. But this, this again, this treaty uh, ceased to exist in June of 2002. Next. There's Kissinger talking about arms control is not about arms control. The SALT II Treaty, June 79, that's Carter and Brezhnev standing, uh, sitting there uh, signing numerical equality of number of nuclear delivery vehicles, limiting the number of deployed MIRV missiles. By this time, we had multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles, but again, not ratified because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, as I mentioned in December 79. Next. Here's the INF Treaty. We're just giving you a little more detail in each of these treaties. That's the Reagan-Gorbachev Treaty, prohibited short-range and intermediate-range ballistic and ground launch cruise missiles with a range between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. The Russians tested and then deployed a ground launch cruise missile with a range of 2,500 kilometers in 2017 that's a violation of the treaty. US after multiple warnings withdrew in August. Uh, so that's a year and a half ago. Start one and start two. Start one, 1991 limited 6,000 nuclear warheads deployed on 1600 ICBMs, which is a removal of 80% of all deployed strategic nuclear weapons. And in 1993, remember, uh, going back to the INF, at the peak of the Cold War, the U.S. had 8,000 intermediate range weapons in Europe. Uh, and this was to get, that INF treaty was to get rid of all of them. So that, was, that is literally disarmament. In 1993, just before George H.W. Bush left office, he, he completed the Star II treaty, which banned use of MIRV ICBMs. It was ratified by the U.S. in 1996. The Russians ratified it in 2000, but then uh, they withdrew after the U.S. withdrew from the ABM Treaty. So none of these treaties are still in operation. Go ahead. There's New START, Obama and Medvedev. Uh, signing the agreement in uh, April 2010 in Prague and uh, ratified, entered into force February 2011 and Biden and Putin have agreed on the extension to February 2026. New START followed up START 1, limiting the number of deployed weapons to 1550, number of deployed launchers to 800. Okay. You should get familiar with these numbers just so you're in the ballpark, you know roughly what was agreed to. More? Uh, the, uh, the new START agreement allowed for satellite and remote monitoring for verification and 18 on-site inspections per year for treaty verification. This is quite intrusive. The U.S. obviously always wants more uh, verification than less, 
because of fear that the Russians would violate the treaty. The Russians are usually less concerned because they think they have their own intelligence capabilities to verify U.S. deployments. For ratification of New START, the Republicans demanded gr a great increase in the nuclear weapons development budget in order to have their support for ratification. So this is an internal U.S. negotiation. When I was in the Defense Department, Senator Kyle, who was the uh, Arizona senator, a key figure, very smart, very conservative guy, very familiar with this uh, uh, material, insisted that a chunk of the Defense Department budget had to be transferred to the Department of Energy budget to NNSA so that uh, there could be a stockpile stewardship program for uh, further funding of new of US nuclear weapons development. And Obama agreed to that, after which many of the Republicans who uh, insisted on it, including Kyle, didn't vote for ratification anyway. But the agreement did pass pretty handily, uh, 71 to 26. So, so New START was ratified in February 2011 and now has been extended for five years. Professor Nacht, I think Jacob has a question. Jacob? Yes. Maybe. Uh, maybe hey, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm out sideways, Wendy. Sorry. But could you, Dr. Nacht, could you talk to how each of these treaties defined a nuclear weapon for if there are differences between them? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, I, I think he, he, can you talk about each of the treaties? And so I, I think what he means is the, can you go through each of the treaties and sort of go through the different uh, limits on the, on sort of what was limited the counting for each one of them? So can you hear me better now, actually? Sorry, yeah. I was getting out, getting out of the wind. So this is Jacob Spinnett from Wannell. Can you talk to how these different treaties defined a nuclear weapon in terms of or for counting purposes? Yes, I mean, you know, it's essential you have warheads on board missiles. The missiles are called delivery vehicles. The warheads are the bombs. And uh, the, the key one that's still left, the New START Treaty, is 1,550 bombs on board 800 delivery vehicles with a mixture of the weapons, some on ICBMs, some on SLBMs, and some on long-range bombers. Although I'll tell you, actually, it was never uh, totally clarified about the number of bombs carried on a bomber. Uh, each uh, bomber was uh, all allocated just one bomb, when, of course, bombers can carry many bombs. But this was somewhat ameliorated by the verification and on-site inspection uh, elements of the treaty. Now, actually, another little uh, footnote here. At the very end of the Trump administration, Trump actually proposed to Putin that for extension of new stars, there would be a freeze on new weapons and further intrusive verification procedures, which Putin did not accept. And when Biden and Putin just had this conversation based upon what's publicly known, Biden did not push for the agreement that Trump had proposed. So the New START Treaty has been extended without any further provisions to limit warhead deployment or to uh, increase verification techniques. The overall, the overall point I would say is this is a, uh, given that the US-Soviet relations, US-Russia relations are not good, we have all these other issues. We've got the Navalny problem in Russia, domestic politics, we have Russia's 
uh, funding the uh, uh, Taliban to kill Americans in Afghanistan. We have the Russian involvement in Syria civil war, Russian uh, ties with Iran, Russian uh, involvement in the US 2016 presidential election, which Trump denied, but which the US intelligence community has confirmed and Russian involvement in the US 2020 election. So that's a full plate of negative developments. So this is the one positive thing on the other side, trying to keep the relations with Russia from sort of going off the rails completely. And remember the Kissinger view, it's not just about arms control. It's not just about limiting the weapons. It's about managing the relationship. That's important. Okay. Are we out of the slides, Mensuk, or is there another one? This is the end of the slides. This is the end of the slides. Okay. So that's uh, any other questions or comments? I'm trying to, uh, the point of this section is just to you to get an understanding of the role of nuclear arms control in the US, Russian, US Soviet nuclear competition. Not only the military dimension, but the political dimension, the strategic dimension. Okay. Okay, then I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Van Bibber for the next part of the session. Carl? Aaron, is Dr. Ben Biber there? I think he's, up. he's here now. And he's muted. I'm looking for the button for share here. Hold on. Oh, do you have to make, am I a co-host there, Aaron? Uh, I, you, yes, are, you, you, you are indeed a yes, co-host. Uh, yeah. Okay. You can share the slide. Ah, okay. Here we are. Okay. There we are. Okay. Uh, after 11 months, I'm still fumbling here. Okay. Um, good. I'm going to share the screen. And today, what we are going to do... Good. And I'm going to go to full screen and... You can see... Um, great. Um, you can see the title slide here. Let's pick up where we left off, <clears throat> do a quick reprise. Uh, we talked about the history uh, of um, uh, fission in uh, the discovery in December of 1938, um, just five years after uh, Rutherford's uh, uh, unbelievable comment about anyone uh, expecting useful uh, energy to derive from nuclear reactions is talking moonshine. Um, uh, the evidence from uh, the, this uh, nuclear chemistry techniques that they used. Um, we talked about the, uh, the letter uh, under the instigation of uh, Leo Szilard um, uh, to uh, uh, to get Fermi to uh, send in a, uh, what was largely a pre-prepared letter to Roosevelt to get moving, uh, which then got into high gear after the, um, uh, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Now, I think we sh left off ab about this point. So let me pick up right here. Here is Alfred Neer, a uh, son of German immigrants, uh, grew up in Minnesota. Um, it was known, he was one of the fathers of, um, uh, one of the fathers of mass spectrometry. So all of science owes a great deal to him and a few others who developed uh, very high resolution mass uh, spectrometry, which is now incredibly useful, of course, for uh, chemistry, molecular biology, of course, uh, physics itself. Uh, it was known at the time uh, once that um, the fission of um, uranium by um, 
slow neutrons was known, it was known that there were uh, at least two stable isotopes of uh, uranium, and it was not known which one um, uh, was the one, if, if or perhaps both. And so it was suggested um, that uh, uh, that near uh, separate a very very small quantity of uh, of uh, uranium into two thirty eight and two thirty five. Uh, 238 being uh, 99.3% and 235 being 0.7%, uh, very subdominant, um, and uh, send it to John Dunning at Columbia, um, who could then produce neutrons, moderate them, slow them down, and then uh, have them impinge on uh, the uh, uh, on the uranium uh, targets, and then see which of these led to um, uh, fission. Now, I'll make this a little uh, more clear in the next slide, but here you see <clears throat> uh, this um, semicircular um, uh, tube, a very nice piece of glass blowing, uh, sort of uh, an art. I think every research university had a whole shop of glass blowers who were real artisans. They made all kinds of fancy equipment nowadays that is outsourced and Generally, universities don't have their own. But in, uh, let me go back. Um, so um, what he has here is a, a, a source. And, and this is uh, a, a very beautiful piece of engineering, uh, sort of university lab engineering back in the 1940s. This is about the size of a sugar cube. Um, um, you see uh, what is basically a little miniature oven um, where he uh, has his uh, natural uranium. I'm not exactly sure what form it was in, whether it was uranium chloride or what. Um, it, you see around it, he packs these little heaters. Those are little resistive heaters, probably about a centimeter long or so. Um, power for them comes in here. And then uh, just standing a few millimeters away, you see this little uh, plate of steel with a very, very, very fine cut, very fine slot cut right through it. Uh, and this is held off at a voltage of some uh, thousands of volts. And the idea here is that when one heats um, the little crucible here of uh, uranium, um, you get a vapor. But of course, anytime you heat something, there's going to be a small probability that, in fact, some of these things will be charged singly charged, uh, positively charged. So here's the, the cathode. Um, the uh, ions will stream out here and be accelerated towards uh, the, uh, the cathode. Um, all of them will have the same energy independent of the mass. And it will be whatever voltage is applied here times the fundamental electric charge. Now you say, what's with uh, the semicircular design? This obviously is going to be placed in a magnetic field inside the, the poles of a dipole field, a little bit like a small cyclotron. And um, charged particles traveling with a certain uh, uh, momentum will curve like this. And then on the other end here, he has a little catcher. And again, this is a, you look at the size of this thing, it's a very miniature little piece of sheet steel here, sort of tack welded on. And what happens is that he accelerates, uh, he runs this apparatus for a number of hours. And um, the, and I'll go on to the next slide at this point. Um, the, you know, that the energy I can write is one half mv squared, non relativistically, or I can write that as p squared over 2m. If I simply rearrange that, I can show that the, the, the momentum is the square root of twice the energy times the mass. Now, at the source, remember, I keep the slit on the cathode at a, uh, the cathode is at a, a given fixed negative voltage. Um, and uh, I heat this, uh, you get a small number of these uh, uranium ions are charged. They'll uh, be accelerated up, uh, independent of whether they're 235 or 238, they'll, they'll be at something like, for example, 10,000 uh, volts energy. Um, and 
here, what it shows, it shows you is that a smaller mass will have a smaller momentum, a larger mass will have a larger momentum. But it's also true that the radius of curvature, just again, very simple uh, freshman physics, the radius of curvature um, will go uh, uh, proportional to the momentum and inversely proportional to the magnetic field and the charge. Twice the magnetic field, twice a tight a circle there. Uh, the, 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 the radius of the circle will go down. But for a fixed radius, um, uh, uh, or, or, or the, uh, uh, for a uh, fixed field, the radius will go like the momentum divided by the field and the charge. So a smaller mass will have a smaller radius, larger mass, larger radius. And you can see what happens is that the, these, uh, the 238 will take the outside uh, kind of uh, lane and the, and the uranium will, find, will take the inside lane there. And what happened after a number of uh, hours of irradiation is that this little foil had two very small uh, lines that looked like stains on the uranium. And then he mailed this to Dunning at Columbia. Uh, Dunning uh, cut the thing in half and then sequentially put the two in uh, to the cyclotron with the moderator, made, made neutrons, moderated them. 235, 238, nothing, 235, the whopping signals seen in the, uh, uh, you know, from the fission fragments in a, in a uh, uh, geiger muller tube. And so it was determined uh, that the smaller uh, species, or the, uh, the, the minority species, was the one that was fissionable by slow neutrons. Just some local history here while we're talking uh, the, uh, the war stories here. Um, we had, a when I was chair of the department uh, from 2012 to 2018, my, about the second year I was there, I got, uh, we got a call from uh, Phil Broughton, who was one of the EHS uh, tech, uh, technicians um, in um, the, uh, uh, in EHS, uh, Environmental Health and Safety, and he was down at the uh, Hazardous Waste Revetment, which is a storage facility on campus, uh, where um, uh, old uh, samples and uh, used things that have been radioactively contaminated or stored up and then shipped out to wherever they had the contract with at the time, either Idaho or Nevada or whatnot. And um, he called me up and he said, you know, uh, he says, we've got this um, uh, cigar box. It's an Alhambra cigar box, five cents uh, cigar <laughs> cigars. He said, it goes way back. Um, there's a little plastic box in there uh, with a little reticule in it. And it's uh, all in a little plastic uh, Ziploc bag. And there's a typed sheet in there uh, that is purportedly from Glenn Seaborg. And the documentation on this piece of paper um, indicates that um, when you, this thing that you see when you look through the reticule, you see a very, very small platinum strip, a little wire like this. And on the tip of it is something about the size of a flake of pepper. And he says, this document, um, this document purports represents that this thing on the end of the platinum strap is the world's first macroscopic source of plutonium. Um, and he said, um, you know, it was known that Seaborg tended to store things that he wanted to keep in Alhambra cigar boxes. So we, we, we would tend to agree that this is uh, probably the real McCoy. Would you like it or should we throw it out? <laughs> or should we dispose of it? And I said, hold on, <laughs> give us the box. So he, he brought us the box up to our nuclear lab. We looked at it and I, I convened a, um, uh, a group of our faculty to decide what we should do with it. Should we try to do uh, an invasive measurement, i.e pry open or break open this glued together lucite box? Uh, could one do passive spectroscopy? So Rick Norman, uh, a summer student and a, um, a sort of a, a research associate that he had said, look, we can do this with, with X-ray and gamma ray spectroscopy. And sure enough, um, after they looked at the spectral, spectrum lines coming out of this thing, they said, this thing is consistent with aged plutonium 
that um, uh, is approximately, uh, at that time it was uh, 70 uh, some years old. And they estimated that the, um, the, 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 uh, the mass of the spectrum that they were measuring, since these were very well calibrated geranium detectors, uh, was 2.3 plus or minus 0 0.4 micrograms of plutonium uh, uh, oxide, plutonium 239. And sure enough, that was bang on what, what was represented in the, uh, the little type sheet. And um, so um, we were a little afraid of the, of the publicity about this thing, um, but he published it in a scholarly journal. Next thing you know, the reporters were all over this thing and it, it created a, a blizzard of very positive news around the world. And so we put it on the main Berkeley website, you know, the Berkeley University uh, website there, uh, and it, it attracted a lot of very positive news. The plutonium, the world's first plutonium that was created by Seaborg, um, was, uh, uh, at, is actually in the Smithsonian. It's on a little foil. It is a microscopic source. Um, you can just see a little bit of a stain uh, there on it. This is the first uh, amount that was actually separated. So in the summer of 1942, uh, Seaborg, who I think was just recently married at the time, he has a kept a logbook, uh, which is basically a, a sort of interwoven life, his own life story, plus all his scientific uh, doings. Um, and, um, you know, he knew he was going to be a man of history. So he recorded everything that he did. And um, he, uh, the, the sort of the high intensity production uh, was done both at the Berkeley Cyclotron and at the Washington um, University Cyclotron in St. Louis um, uh, in 1941. And in 1942, um, he goes by train to Chicago to what's, what was called the Met Lab. I think it was named after Jones, it was called the Jones Met Lab. And he convened the best chemists in the, in the, the free world, and uh, mostly uh, you know, the American chemists. And in the space of a few months, they took a, a tiny sample. Uh, I mean, first of all, it came in boxes of, of this kind of uh, um, powder or ore. Um, and uh, created this tiny, precipitated this tiny sample. So they, they were basically creating on the fly uh, the chemistry to separate out plutonium, which was an element that the, 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 the human beings had never seen before. And, but they actually figured out the chemistry which allowed them to do the precipitation. And what we have here at Berkeley, at some, someday it's going to be in a little uh, showroom or a little a miniature, uh, um, a, a museum inside uh, the uh, chemistry building um, there. Uh, probably, I don't know, it'll be in Latimer or wherever in, uh, on here on campus. Anyway, um, that's a, or Gilman Hall. Uh, I think it's a nice piece of local history. Okay, let's get on to more technical things here about fission. Um, <clears throat> this was the basic picture uh, here. Um, the um, uh, and this is the picture that Lisa Meitner had figured out that everyone else kind of overlooked, which was the idea that a neutron um, impinging on a nucleus, which due to its you know large uh, size, its very large uh, in, internal uh, Coulomb force, um, was um, barely stable. Um, uh, in fact, would impart enough energy to it um, that this thing could then begin to deform. Once it begins to deform, um, and then you start getting kind of like two separated centers of, uh, of, of the, uh, you know, two things that begin to look like fragments, the Coulomb repulsion would, would pull this thing apart, think of it a little bit like taffy snap, and then you would have this, this uh, enormous release of energy as this thing skied down the end of the Coulomb potential hill, releasing um, a great deal of energy. In doing so, fission fulfilled the, um, uh, the condition that Szilard had imagined and actually created a patent on, even though he had no idea what reaction would do it, of a reaction 
induced by a neutron that itself would produce multiple neutrons, which would lead to a kind of an exponential um, uh, release of energy. So that's the picture. Um, and as Cerber mentioned, as I think uh, you saw in the, that, that the documentary, The Day After Trinity, Cerber was relating that the day he had heard about it, he said, everybody around the world was slapping their heads saying, how could I be uh, so foolish as not to see something which is now completely obvious how the, the thing of fission came apart. Everyone kept saying, very heavy nucleus going into two medium weight nu nuclei, like, you know, what's up with that? That can't happen. And in hindsight, it, it is actually now it very became very transparent. Okay, um, just to again reinforce um, um, the uh, what we've mentioned before. Um, here I'm just expanding the top part of the uh, curve of binding energy. Uh, ah, there we are. Um, um, uh, and uh, as we commented when we were doing our gymnastics of uh, calculating Q values, whether uh, processes, decay, or reactions were exothermic releasing energy or endothermic requiring energy, had this curve been completely flat, there'd be no profit to be made by anything, neither fusing or fizzing atomic nuclei would have yielded no energy. The fact that it is very, that it is not flat and, uh, and, and in fact, beyond the iron group begins to fall off slightly. And this is, it goes down by a little over an MeV uh, from the uh, iron group at about 8.8 .8 MeV per nucleon down to a little over 7.5, sort of 7.6 like this is what gives the possibility of um, either controlled or, uh, uh, or uh, explosive release of huge amounts of energies from very, very uh, small samples. And the numerics again is real simple. If I were to take an atomic nucleus in the range of mass 240, and um, so it has, uh, each of, it has on about 7.6 MeV binding energy times whatever that number is, 236 or 240 uh, neutrons on uranium 235, uranium on, uh, or neutrons on plutonium 239. Um, the by splitting it in half, I now have two nuclei which are more tightly bound by one MeV per nucleon, not one MeV, but one MeV times 240. So this is um, a, a great deal of uh, energy that is, uh, that is possible uh, to release. Okay. Now, how is this energy partitioned? Well, the actual number turns out to be, um, uh, uh, as we mentioned, around 200 MeV. It actually varies from event to event, uh, depending on the final products. Uh, the final products uh, are not always the same two nuclei that you, they come out in a kind of a distribution. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, most of it is kinetic energy. And the thing to realize is that um, these very, very heavy uh, nuclei uh, are intrinsically unstable. It, in principle, it does not take a neutron or uh, any other kind of object coming into uranium um, uh, or thorium or anything like that to, to have it split in two. Uh, however, the spontaneous fission lifetimes are very, very, very long or put differently, the, uh, uh, since they can decay otherwise, alpha particles, uh, alpha emission or, or beta emission uh, to um, go to a lower energy state, um, the percentage of uh, nuclei that will actually go by fission, spontaneous fission compared to anything else is very, very, very tiny. However, if I give it a little bit more energy, then it will, it will go bang. So um, about 80% of the energy is coming out in, uh, in the kinetic energy of these two large fragments. The energy associated with the neutrons is not very great. It's, uh, but the interesting thing is that the neutron number uh, is there and it's, it's between two and three, 
depending on what species you're fissioning and uh, uh, what energy you're uh, coming in with. The, um, there are uh, gamma rays are emitted even in the process of, of uh, fissioning while the thing is still a single unit uh, like that. You, you, this thing is still already a, a hot nucleus and it's picking up energy uh, as the thing is beginning to, uh, the, 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 the fragments are beginning to heat even as the, uh, the nucleus is um, deforming. After the scission, um, you will get more gamma rays, another several MeV, about seven MeV on the average, um, as these uh, nuclei begin to um, beta decay uh, to excited states of daughters, which beta decay to, uh, to excited state of daughters and so forth. The beta particles themselves um, represent uh, uh, another several MeV, and then uh, you get about 10 MeV in neutrinos, which are scientifically interesting, but in fact are not uh, at all useful um, in terms of um, um, their, uh, you know, their, their role in either a reactor or uh, a bomb. Now, uh, one of the people who may be coming to visit us um, in, uh, uh, to give a talk in the technical lectures in the second half is Adam Bernstein uh, from some years ago at Sandia, now for many years at uh, Livermore, uh, who's one of the leaders of uh, in the um, applied anti-neutrino community. Um, although it took uh, these ghostly particles took more than 20 years to detect after they were first predicted by Pauli, uh, they have now become a very interesting potential tool uh, for uh, reactor monitoring at great distances, simply because they can fly out of the core of the reactor um, uh, and can be seen up hundred, several hundred kilometers away. Physicists have actually done very interesting, uh, learned a great deal about neutrinos and their properties and the ability of neutrinos to oscillate from one flavor into another by looking at neutrinos very, very far away from the core of a, of a reactor. Um, not easy, requires very, very large detectors, um, but is now being seriously looked at as a tool for nonproliferation. In fact, the US and Britain are now involved, the NNSA and uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the um, um, British community are now in, um, I think AWE plus P Park, uh, the uh, sort of the basic science funding uh, agency in Britain are now involved in a joint venture to put a very large water Cherenkov detector um, in the Boulby mine up in the Northeast of, um, of uh, uh, Britain, uh, about 25 kilometers away. I'm forgetting what the name of the reactor is there uh, to really do a no nonsense look at its capability uh, for standoff uh, uh, monitoring of reactors. Anyway. You may, you may be seeing um, um, Adam Bernstein coming here later in the, in the course. Now, important point. Um, when you look at the chart of the nuclei, it's at first blush, you see a valley. Now, if you look a little more closely and just say, just take kind of the 30,000 foot view of it, what's the second most obvious fact that you see um, about this chart? Let's see if we have any uh, clever. The valley of stability. The what? The valley of stability. Yes. Uh, and uh, yes, but if you just look at the whole thing, what else do you see about it? It's not a, a map. It kind of goes in a line up into the right. What kind it of leans to the neutron heavy side. It's what? It leans to the neutron uh, yeah. rich side. It's slightly bow shaped. It's not a perfectly straight line. Um, uh, so when you think about it, you know, all your light nuclei tend to be pretty much uh, uh, neutrons equal protons up to calcium 40. After that, again, it's the role of the Coulomb repulsion force there. Uh, there it tends to prefer, it tends to prefer uh, being neutron heavy. In fact, by the time you get up to uranium, it's very much so. Um, uh, uranium 238 is uh, 
let's see, uh, 92, 146. So it's actually distinctly uranium, uh, neutron heavy, which means to say on the average, even though uh, in any given split, it can be any combination of neutrons and protons so long as they total up uh, to the original mass, um, what you can guess is that these fragments are likely going to fall uh, here on the south wall, uh, the, the, uh, or kind of the south, the, uh, the south slope, uh, if you will, of the valley here. They're going to be on the neutron rich side, which means to say, and again, as you remember the valley of stability, it's really a valley. It, uh, the, the nuclei up on the sides of the valley are, are, uh, have a higher mass, i.e. higher energy than the valley. Um, they're going to find a way to ski down to the bottom, but they're gonna start on the neutron rich side. So what you're gonna see is not positron decays, you're gonna be seeing um, um, uh, beta decays, ordinary uh, decays of, uh, of an electron and an antineutrino to get down to the valley of stability. Something I didn't point out before, um, and we're not, a, not hugely germane here, but some of you, of course, are taking Lee Bernstein's course. You'll, whoopsie daisy. Um, uh, when you look on the chart of the nucleides, you'll actually see some rows and some columns delineated by a double heavy line. And in some places you'll actually find atomic nuclei, which are really at the intersection of the two. Um, just as in atomic physics, you have uh, what are called shell closures. You actually close, you actually fill up a quantum mechanical shell, and those atoms are particularly stable from a chemical point of view. So uh, helium, uh, sort of uh, uh, neon, uh, and so forth, like that, sort of uh, krypton, xenon. Uh, um, argon, of course, I missed argon, so helium and so forth. In atomic nuclei, you have, since it, again, is a quantum mechanical system of spin a half particles, and therefore you fill up shells, there are places where you actually have sh gaps in energy, sort of shell closures, and those nuclei tend to be uh, exceptionally stable. Exceptionally stable means they're particularly well bound, i.e. going to be in lower, lower mass or lower energy, um, and they, these shell closures uh, play a special role in dictating both structure and reactions. Um, anyway, um, good. So uh, lead 208 uh, is in fact a, um, a doubly closed, it's closed in protons and closed in neutrons. Um, 182 protons, 126 neutrons. Calcium 40 is doubly closed, it's 20 and 20. Okay, good enough. Now, odd thing, uh, not terribly germane, uh, or absolutely necessary to know in this course, but I think it's, it's an important fact to know about vision. Uh, you might say, well, you know, you split something in um, uh, of mass 240 in, in half. Uh, well, maybe they'll be around mass 120. Um, it, in fact, uh, there are hundreds uh, uh, of permutations of, of fission fragments that you can get. And the fission, for reasons you'll find out when you take, well, maybe undergraduate, certainly graduate nuclear physics, tends to split up asymmetrically. Go figure. Uh, typically, you're going to get a fragment in the mass 95 range and, and a fragment in the mass uh, 100 and 137 range. Uh, so you'll see things um, uh, like uh, uh, strontium and things of that mass. You'll also see things in the kind of the, the, um, the cesium barium uh, mass range as well. So, um, and in fact, symmetric for very low energy fission or for fission uh, happening with slow neutrons, the, f the probability that you get a really symmetric split is way down, it almost never happens. It's sort of at the percent level. Sort of at the 10% level, you get a very typical, you know, 95, 135 type uh, split. Here on this graph, it actually shows you what happens uh, once you, the primary fission fragment uh, is emitted within 
anywhere from milliseconds to seconds, um, this thing begins to beta decay down. Here you have uh, xenon 140, 14 second half-life to cesium, 64 second. Uh, barium lives for about 13 days, lanthanum 140, 40, uh, 40 hours, and then into, into uh, cerium, which is stable. Okay. I think I have here, ah, fr from the point of view of uh, environmental and health um, ramifications of fission fragments, okay. Um, it, you, fission produces a, a vast array of um, isotopes um, and of varying half-lives and activities. And for obvious reasons, the short ones you don't have to worry about. Um, once you, you know, if the half-life uh, of something is um, 10 seconds, uh, if you wait um, uh, 10 half-lives, uh, one half to the 10th power is uh, 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 about uh, uh, one and a, is, it's down by a factor of a thousand, it's 1024 like that. If you wait 20 half-lives, you're down by a million. So short half-life species um, uh, are, you just wait them out. In fact, you don't have to wait very long and they're gone. The very long ones also, you don't need to worry about because if it doesn't, if the half-life is very long, then very few, if I take a sample of, of material, radioactive material, things which have a very, very long half-life, you don't worry about because it doesn't happen anyway. It's the ones in the middle you got to worry about you particularly want to worry about the things um, that are uh, sort of uh, comparable to uh, sort of a, a human lifespan, i.e. something that's sort of generational in time up to tens or hundreds of generations. Being responsible people, we worry about burying nuclear waste uh, out to the time frame of um, you know, uh, some uh, 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 thousands or tens of thousands or millions of years. I think courts have opined that uh, uh, that uh, the, 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 the country should be responsible uh, for consequences going out something like a million years, which I think is beginning to border on the silly. But um, in any case, uh, for some, such a, a, a long time, but when you have fission products like cesium-137 that you hear about uh, 30 years, strontium-90 is uh, 29 years like this, those are the, the guys uh, that you need to worry about. In fact, when I was growing up, um, uh, all parents were worried about the uptake uh, when we were still doing above ground nuclear testing about the um, uptake of fission products that were being spread invisibly around the world and then raining out. Um, you could actually see measurable amounts of these things in rainwater. It was showing up in crops. Crops are being eaten by cows. Children are drinking milk. And everyone was worrying about the effects of uh, strontium showing up in children's bones. Um, now, I think, uh, unless you were very close to the primary event, that tends not to be something you, you worry about too much, but look at the half-life. It is really very comparable. You know, you're even several half-lives out, two, three, four half-lives out, you're still within a human uh, time, uh, uh, human individual human uh, time frame there. This is a, um, I, I, uh, I'm always embarrassed by looking at some of the, uh, the cross cuts or the uh, isotones uh, uh, because uh, when you look at a simple liquid drop model as you'll see from Lee Bernstein, um, it's predicted to be a parabola. Sometimes they look like, you know, V-shaped or uh, otherwise erratic, but this is kind of a picture perfect. This is something suitable for framing. Here's the mass 137, and it's a very, very beautifully parabolic uh, crosscut. Uh, if I uh, take A equals 137, crosscut to the value of stability. Here's the neutron rich side here. Um, here you see uh, tin 137. Um, and uh, here you see the, um, the beta, the Q beta is 10.2 MeV. And general rule of thumb, you, you can hardly go wrong in physics. 
Um, and that is that all other things being equal, the larger the energy difference between the, the, the uh, mother and the daughter state, the, the initial state and the final state, the more readily that thing will go. So notice that the half-life here is 190 milliseconds. That's really fast. Now, when I go, uh, this, is, this is from the tin to the antimony. If I go from the antimony 137 to tellurium 137, it's um, that the Q value is 9.3 MeV. And it's 450 milliseconds. When I go from the tellurium down to the um, um, iodine, um, then it's uh, the Q value is 7.05, and that's 2.49 seconds. Um, the iodine to the xenon, the Q value is 6.0, and that's 25 seconds. The next one is 3.8 minutes, and then 30.8 years, and then the barium 137 is is stable like that. So it's really the kind of the penultimate uh, species here on the ski slope down to the value of stability that you worry about as a fission product. And then here's the, the other side, which is not germane. Rarely does a fission product end up being very proton rich over here. Okay, I think we're doing fine. Let's just watch a short, um, there's lots of, as I mentioned, there's lots and lots of very good um, science on YouTube. There are notes available on the website. Wonder. This is our home. Hey. Howdy, neighbors. Hey, buddy. Really now. All right, hold on. Where is this? I'll tell you what, why don't we hold that on for next time or I'll, I'll, what I, I'm going to put this up and have you watch it yourself. Uh, let me just show one more thing here. Um, what are the two isotopes we mentioned uranium 235 the, the minority uh, component of natural uranium. It's there. It's in the ground. It's in, uh, you know, it's in uh, the parts per million few parts per million of the construction materials of the apartment building you're living in or your house or the ground around you. You just have to dredge it up and do the hard work of separating it. Plutonium needs to be cooked. It needs to be created in a reactor as a byproduct of uranium reactors. And uh, here it's due to the fact that it is in the normal course of operating a reactor. Where's my cursor? Here it is. Um, you will have some uranium uh, absorbing a neutron and not uh, the, the natural or the, the, the inert part of uranium capturing a neutron forming uranium-239, which then undergoes two sequential beta decays, 24 minutes and then 2.4 days. Uh, uranium to Neptunium-239, Neptunium-239 to Plutonium-239. Uh, and then you've got something which is, I think, 24,000 years or so like that. And this then needs to be separated and then uh, later on in the course, we're going to talk quite a bit about um, uh, separation technologies and then what's called reprocessing, chemical reprocessing to pull plutonium out. And the challenges they both present uh, in the, uh, in the nonproliferation community. So with that, we're about a minute ahead. I'll take any questions. Okay. Good to see you all. And uh, let's see, next lecture uh, uh, will be Wednesday. And Professor Nacht, would you like to go first or shall I go first? Yes. Well, it's up to you. Fine. Okay. Uh, we will also be starting discussions this week. I sent the announcement out through B courses. So. See some of you on Friday. All right, thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. you.